I think she tried to trick me up on the minutes. I'm gonna, I caught her, I think, giving me a hard time. So I'm gonna catch her at the minutes. Um, almost there. Okay, I'm showing six o'clock without um, an objection. I'm gonna open the meeting. This is the Lewis Planning Commission, Wednesday, April 21st, 2021, regular monthly meeting. Um, we have seven commissioners present. John Nearboss, uh, unfortunately is under the weather and will not be joining us. And Tom Panetta had a conflict he was trying to clear, which obviously hasn't been accomplished yet, it may be yet. So there are seven commissioners present, a sufficient quorum to conduct business, and we will proceed. The first order of business is an announcement that I regret hearing from Kay Carnahan. Thank you, Chairman. I wanted to let everyone know that for the first time since 2001, I will not be seeking reappointment to the Lewis Planning Commission. So this is my last Planning Commission meeting. I have found my 20 years on this commission to be a growth experience from learning the codes and issues to becoming comfortable with engaging the public and applicants. But it is time to step into a different role and allow someone new with fresh talent and energy to offer to step in and enjoy the role as much as I have. I am grateful for the city's trust in me to provide leadership in this way. Now I look forward to becoming the city beaches commissioner and applying my time and energy to this new position. The LPC is, in the, is the strongest it has ever been, and it has the best chairman we have ever had. This group will continue to do great and hard work. So uh, thank you so much. That is my announcement, Mr. Chairman. And I will say that when we come to the first item on the agenda, I will need to recuse myself. So I will turn off my audio and video, but continue to listen. Thank Unfortun you. Unfortunately, uh... Vice Chair, this is not like accepting resignation. If it were up to us to accept your resignation, you would not have that, uh, that luxury. We would want you to Thank continue you. because you've made such valuable contributions throughout <laughs> your 20 years and we will be less without you. Um, we will all have to step up to carry some of the burden that you have shouldered and some of the wise counsel you've provided. Um, if we were not in a Zoom situation, we would be doing more to say, We'll miss you, but we'll try and do that down the road when we're in person again. But um, on behalf of everyone in Lewis, especially your peers on this commission, uh, we thank you for your many dedicated years of service and contributions. And we wouldn't be where we are today without having had you at our side and pointing us in the right direction or sometimes kicking us in the other end of the extremity to get us moving. So thank you very much, sincerely. And we will un undoubtedly miss you. Uh, and um, I don't know what else to say. Anybody else have any comments? I uh, Well, just quickly, Kay, thanks so much for all of your work on this committee, all of your uh, guidance. I don't know what the committee and the city are going to do without your uh, amazing um, organizational skills and um, encyclopedic memory of everything that's gone on. Um, and thank you, I mean, thanks for stepping into the beach roll, but it, it should also be noted all of the various committees, ad hoc and otherwise, that, that you have helped out through the years. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And everyone will miss, I mean, you're moving on too. So it's, you know, big changes. And uh, what I've learned this year is change is good, it's positive. So thank you. Thank you both, uh, and, and Councilperson Osler, we will indeed miss you. And um, we'll look forward to our first uh, field trip to New Hampshire. <laughs> You're all welcome. <laughs> but, but just to, just to uh, we're not moving. I, people have stopped and asked me that we're not moving. We just have a, we're just trying this out um, as a second house. So anyway, it's been a pleasure. Um, keep up the good work. And best, best wishes, Godspeed to both of you and your all your future endeavors, whatever they are for the city or otherwise, seriously. Thank you. All right, turning to unfinished business. Um, 
presentation, discussion, and possible recommendation to Marin City Council regarding the final subdivision plan for Lewis Waterfront Preserves located off New Road, zoned AX Res, S Sussex County Tax Map 335-8.00-17.00. Tonight, it is our opportunity to consider the final site plan, to offer recommendations, if any, to Marin City Council to approve or deny the final application with or without conditions. Following our uh, recommendation uh, being forwarded to Marin City Council, um, they will review it, they will hold a public hearing, and then the Marin City Council will act. And Glenn, if I'm not mistaken, given the waivers that have been issued in this instance, the Marin City Council have until August 19th, is that correct? That's right. So just for everyone's edification and for the record, there have been two waivers granted to the applicant um, to continue the city's consideration of this matter. And for those of you who weren't here, which I think is a majority of the commissioners, the, the preliminary consent was granted by the Planning Commission on August 19, 2019, long time ago. And the two waivers that were granted to extend at six months each, the uh, applicability of the, the application for, for this site um, were done pursuant to code 170-19 subparagraph F2B. Um, that was done by the building official in concert with the other city officials and I'm sure the city solicitor. To help us reconstruct sort of where we are, I've asked both Glenn and Janelle to take a lead initial role in refreshing or updating our recollection about where we are and how we got here. This is somewhat of a unique situation given the change in 2018 to the um, AX Res um, code and the consideration of this matter. Uh, there was some, if you recall, some issues raised about the Planning Commission's consideration in August. So I want Glenn to give us first a refresher on the legal framework within which we consider this matter tonight. And then I'm going to ask Janelle to take us through the process following that preliminary consent, what's been done. We have a substantial record that's been laid out before us online at our site for everyone on this phone, on this uh, Zoom call or otherwise. I think there are about 30 other participants on this call. Uh, there are lots of documentation that pertain to this matter, uh, but I want Janelle to give us the substance of what's happened since preliminary consent. Uh, and then there's a footnote to add after Janelle finishes of something that's unfortunately come up in the last few days that I'll uh, bring to our attention. It will not alter our consideration, uh, but I want to uh, bring us up to date on all the information we possibly can have. So Glenn, without further ado, would you please set the framework for us based on the statutes and regulations that are applicable at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to do that. The, um, <clears throat> As you said, this is a, has been a lengthy process, um, and this project was granted preliminary approval back in um, August of 2019. Um, this is a major subdivision consideration. Um, you're making a recommendation to um, mayor and city council. Tonight's um, your duty tonight is not to conduct a public hearing. That happened in connection with the um, preliminary. Um, consent, um, city council will conduct another public hearing when it's before them, if, it's, if it goes before them. I mean, it will go before them on a recommendation from you. But a couple of things I wanted to mention are some of the legislative actions that city council has taken since the preliminary consent was granted. Those um, legislative acts and actions do not apply to this particular subdivision application because they are far enough along in the process um, when these uh, new ordinances were adopted. So the first one is um, the wetland buffers ordinance. I'm sorry. Yeah, the wetland buffers ordinance. That's section 197-74 B, D, and G of the city code. It was adopted on October 12, 2020. And the purpose section in that, in that code section um, provides that it provides standards for the establishment of a buffer around all wetlands and major subdivisions 
as well as wetlands boundaries are expected, as the wetland boundaries are expected to change over time, to provide standards for protecting wetlands in major subdivisions, to encourage natural drainage, and to encourage best management practices and design standards. So that was an important piece of legislation that um, you, you as a planning commission worked on and city council worked on that is now part of our code and will go a long way to protect wetlands, but it, but it does not apply to this subdivision application. The second um, piece of legislation that is relevant comes uh, or is found in section 197.73D5D and that's the fill in the floodplain um, ordinance. It was adopted on December 14, 2020, um, more than a year after this project got preliminary consent. And it, it also is not um, applicable to this subdivision application. Um, that ordinance provides that fill within the special flood hazard area shall result in no net loss of natural floodplain storage or increase in water surface elevations during the base flood. Again, another important piece of legislation that really has um, advanced the ball as far as subdivision um, applications go and observing the floodplain, but it just does not have applicability in this, in the context of this particular subdivision application. So those are the legislative pieces that I wanted to um, remind everybody of uh, that have occurred since preliminary consent. Does anybody have questions on, on that? And then Mr. Chair, would you like me to talk at all about the approval section or would Janelle, would you like to do that? We're probably both going to do that because Janelle's going to get fill in the meat. So why don't you set the framework and she'll fill in the meat on the bones with the uh, actions that have been taken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the approval process is in um, <clears throat> chapter 197, planning commission review. And it says, I want to read this section just so you hear it. The planning commission shall review the major subdivision application at an open meeting to confirm that the complete application and related plans comply with all requirements of this chapter. The planning commission shall thereafter submit a report with recommendations to the mayor and city council. This short report shall be accompanied by, and all these items are available um, on the website. First, the city engineer and board of public works report. Second, five copies to be provided by the applicant of the subdivision site plan to be recorded. Um, five copies to be provided by the applicant of the improvement construction plan and the entrance permit or a copy th thereof. So those are the, the, that's what's before you tonight. Again, your, your role in making a recommendation is if the subdivision complies with the subdivision code and in the context of the waivers that have been granted and in the context of the legislation that is and is not applicable to this particular application, if it complies, you're obligated to approve the applicant, recommend approval of the application. As always, you can attach reasonable conditions if there are certain things that continue um, to raise concern about the application and there's a condition that would appropriately address that health, welfare, or safety concern. So uh, Glenn, succinctly, there were no pending ordinance matters that applied to this because all the actions you outlined occurred post submission of the application and preliminary consent. That's correct. Okay. That's for everybody's benefit, not just the commission, but the public want, needs to know that this is the framework within which the commission is charged to make a decision. Janelle, do you wanna talk now please about what's been done by the applicant and what's been submitted so the record uh, is fully uh, understood, please? Be happy to. So since preliminary consent, the applicant has been working with all of the agencies to obtain their approvals. Um, as it pertains to um, the landscaping along New Road, as the property is along a byway, they have reached out and, and worked with the historic Lewis byways regarding the landscaping and the fence that are along there. That's why that you'll see that um, that was coming from the byways. They've gotten their approval from the Office of Drinking Water for the water um, connections and making sure that's okay. They've worked with the Office of the State Fire Marshal regarding turnarounds, um, you know, cul-de-sacs to make sure they meet the requirements for life safety equipment to get in and turn around. So that has been approved. The Sussex Conservation District has reviewed the application and has approved the application for regarding stormwater management. Um, the 
<clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. FEMA has reviewed uh, the application um, regarding floodplain. A portion of the property is in the floodplain. Development, again, is not proposed in the floodplain. That is part of the open space. But they did go through the letter of map amendment to remove a portion of the property from the floodplain that is identified in the documents that are on, this, on the website. The city engineer with BPW have reviewed the plan and determined that it is in, uh, it can move forward to the mayor and city council with your recommendations. They are asking for one waiver request and um, Delta has issued a letter of no objection to recordation for the record plan. However, they are unable to issue, Delta is unable to issue the entrance permit until the plan has been approved. Um, so it's a little bit of a catch-22. You, They can't issue a permit for something that doesn't have approval yet or has been recorded and they're not able to record until um, they, they are granted approval. So the, they are asking for a waiver from that requirement of the subdivision of code. Um, they anticipate having it in the near future, um, but the condition would be predicated upon that um, if you do recommend approval for that, that no building permit shall be issued until, of course, the entrance permit has been submitted to the to the office for um, for um, the file. And again, they wouldn't be able to do anything because they they can't get a building permit because they wouldn't be able to get the entrance because the entrance is going to be the first thing that goes in. Um, now, let me interrupt you just there because there, this is where the wrinkle has come up that is a little bit more complicated, but. I'm advised we should still be able to proceed. And that is that Del Dot has advised BPW that they have not finalized the plans for the bridge on the uh, new road. Ergo, the size of that uh, bridge, which is believed to be 1,700 feet on either end and six feet above the river, um, will have an impact on in two ways. Number one, it could impact um, the entrance configuration. And number two, BPW has already granted, has already granted, has already indicated that they're able to supply water and sewer to this facility, but the redesign of the bridge affects how they can do that. And those won't be resolved, DelDot has said most recently, believe it or not, hold on to your seats until 2024. It's a five-year process and they are looking at 2024 before they approve uh, the recon before they establish the design on the reconfiguration of the bridge. Now, in consultation with BPW, um, they are confident that they will be able to supply the necessary water and sewer based on whatever configuration is under consideration. And there is one that's on the, a Del Dot site. Um, but it is something that is up in the air. So I think the waiver is important because we don't know exactly what impact the bridge is going to have on the entrance. And um, it is, I think, as far as BPW is concerned, not a major obstacle. It is one that they will be able to, to deal with. But in reality, Geldot has thrown them a curveball at the last minute uh, because they have um, deferred or demurred, whatever the right word would be, on establishing a firm plan for the bridge such that BPW and the city can rely upon it. So Charlie had his hand up. So I have, I've brought Charlie on board to, to see if he has some comments regarding that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you summarized it pretty well. Um, what, what I know is that um, the BPW, GMB and the Tower Hill developer are working through the new road utilities alignment with Dell Dot's bridge team and we've had two or three meetings with them and we've um, the Tower Hill subdivision is sort of leading the effort engineering wise and they're revising their plans um, based on our last meeting which was in March and we hope to have a meeting in the next couple of weeks with the Del Dot bridge team to review those revised plans and my whole point in telling you this is, is that I don't think it's going to take until 2024 to get some preliminary acceptance of the board's water, sewer, electric, and now there's going to be natural gas as well uh, crossing Canary Creek so that those utilities can be put in the ground. Um, that said, 
what you said about 2024 is correct about the actual building of the bridge. Um, I think we may have even heard 2025 at our meeting. And when I think about the entrance, I, I, I don't know what to say about that, that the developer would be kind of hamstring to wait until 2024 or 25 before he puts in his entrance. It seems that that's far enough out that, you know, in my opinion, they ought to be able to go with what they can do right now. And, and then Del Dot would have to adjust to that at some point in the future. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Sumner? How different is the, the, you know, how much might the entrance have to move based on what Del Dot is imagining, what they're considering? I mean, we, I've, we, I've we, only seen a preliminary elevation plan and it won't have to move. I, well, it may have to move horizontally, I don't know, but I know vertically they're talking about a zero to two foot retaining wall along that stretch. So I've unmuted uh, Ron Sutton, the engineer for the application. So he might have some additional insight as well. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. <clears throat> okay. When we reworked our entrance from the very first time we brought the plan in front of you, we worked very closely with DelDOT <clears throat> to determine where that entrance could fit and where our road improvements would end. Um, our road improvements right now end at a significantly a pretty good distance away from the bridge because they were going to raise, we decided on an elevation and they were going to take that elevation and run it across Canary Creek. Uh, we have ample space. Um, we have left lots of easements. Um, I don't anticipate our entrance moving one bit because we are aligned perfectly with the street across the street. We've also had to install a crosswalk and a splitter island um, to the further west. And um, <clears throat> at this point in time, I believe Dalat will tie into us and then build the retaining walls that they would need to build to elevate the bridge. That's the other reason, if you remember, Janelle, we had to actually remove the shared use path connection to New Road because Dalat wanted that gone so that because they're going to tie into that directly once they get the bridge going. Sumner, any follow-up questions? Not at this time. Okay. So, oh, well, actually, I'll just ask this. So, so vertically, Mr. Sutton, um, how different might things be? It makes sense that horizontally things might not, not have to move. Uh, I mean, we have enough room there to probably adjust vertically, probably one to two feet with no issues at all. And horizontally, um, you know, they could build tapers in uh, from our entrance to the bridge. There's plenty of distance there. They, they, Del Dot does this all the time. I, I do not anticipate any issues. Thank you. We, we worked very closely with Del Dot to get this, this most recent rendering or entrance plan in place. It's been very painful to tell you the truth. Melanie? Uh, yes, Mr. Sutton, is, is that is this reason why the pedestrian path doesn't extend all the way across the frontage? That is, that is yes. Um, in fact, the developer had to pay, and he's already paid Del Dot for that extension of that shared use path. Um, he, that, that was part of the financial contribution he had to make um, for, for that path down the road. OK. Thank you. Any other commissioner have a question? All right, we'll return to Janelle. Thank you, Mr. Sutton and uh, Charlie, thank you. Janelle, you wanna continue, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> there were a number of conditions that were originally um, placed on the application as it went through the preliminary consent. Um, those you could also find on the, on the city's website. Um, all of those conditions have been complied with. They meet all the requirements. Um, I know Glenn said they're, is not a requirement for a buffer, um, but for the, the cluster subdivision, there actually is one. So this one already had to, uh, to um, comply with a, a, a buffer from the wetlands and an agricultural buffer as well. So that's why you see um, there's actually a 50 foot buffer, uh, which is actually the current code. Um, 
now um, for the cluster option two, there's only a 25 foot buffer from the wetlands, but they are providing a buffer from that. Um, and again, they've obtained all of their agency approvals except for the, the, the physical entrance permit itself um, from DelDOT and um, the city's engineer and BPW have said it's okay to move forward with the items that they need to address, which are very minor. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oh, and there were two waivers that were granted. I apologize. One was for the dead end street that it there's an easement at the end of River Birch Road that extends to the west. Um, there's a cul-de-sac there that is intended. There's an easement for uh, the interconnectivity to the property to the west if it ever develops. So a waiver was granted by mayor and council for the the that road to exceed the maximum length of a dead end street of 200 feet and a waiver was granted regarding the storm drain pipe to ha to regarding the 0.5 percent slope of that storm drain pipe so those have been um, included into the plan and they are also noted on the plan as well yeah can i just add one thing my recollection is that we also uh the the, the developer made some concessions for an adequate turnaround on that dead end so that, that that particular concern was also addressed in connection with the waiver. Janelle, excuse me, Janelle, is that um, the first part of your report? Yes. Okay, I wanted to read, if I may, into the record, something I just got from uh, Del Dot, which says that um, they started the design process a little over a year ago and had a public workshop last June to talk about the approach and consideration for design. Info from the workshop can be found at a Dell Dot website. I have the record here, but just look up Canary Creek Project website. They've been working with BPW to lay out an alignment for an extension of their facilities such that they do not conflict with the project. They've been very corroborative and patient as we work through the challenges laying out the facilities in conjunction with the other utilities for the impending developments, plural developments, while trying not to require a second move once the bridge project comes along. We are planning another public workshop for July of this year to present updated alignment information and potential impacts. Construction is scheduled for 2025, pending the completion of the Old Orchard Savannah Road intersection project. That's the latest from just a few minutes ago from Del Dot. Oh. All right, um, are there any questions for Janelle or for Glenn about the position before us tonight and what our framework is? Sumner? So uh, GMB had a rather lengthy letter with a bunch of things. Is Charlie gonna talk about that letter or is that sort of covered by what Janelle already said? Well, to your satisfaction, either way, if it wasn't covered by Janelle, let's have Charlie go through it to your um, satisfaction. Well, it just seemed like there were a number of items in there that require our consideration. I, I read it and maybe I just misunderstood it. I read it as there were still some outstanding issues, but. Charlie, would you like to respond? Um, sure, it, and Janelle, is it possible to bring Ben Hearn in on, on this as well? Cause he did the review with me just in case there's something that he remembers that maybe I don't, but you know. Yep, he's good to go. Welcome okay. Ben. So, you know, our letter was eight pages, but six pages were, you know, just responding to the planning commission's recommendations and conditions. Um, you know, in terms of the engineering, we feel like the plans are in a position to move forward for approval by city council. Um, there, there's a couple minor things that can, that would have to be coordinated before the construction starts, but, um, I, we don't see any reason to hold it up. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we want to go through every single one of these items, but if there's any one in particular that you have a question about, I'm sure we can address it. Well, I think the one, the one I had, the, you mentioned the BPW and it sounds like we've already got that. Kind of cover oh, on the, the new road utility issue. Well, yeah. yeah, just where the pipes are going to go. Yeah, to we're working our way through that. Yep. Any other specific I, questions, Sumner? 
I'm gonna have to look through my list, but uh, 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 for now, I guess I'm okay. I, um, that's probably that's probably okay. All right, we'll we'll come back. Take your time, Melanie, and then Joe. I'm sorry. I have some questions that I would like to address to Mr. Sutton, if if this is appropriate time. Hang on one second, Joe. Do you have a question for Charlie on this point, or is it for? No, it's it's uh, different items. Okay. Melanie, please. Okay, I'm a little confused about um, the parking on the plan. Uh, there was one plan that showed uh, on-street parking. Uh, I don't mean designated uh, pull-in spaces, I mean parallel parking. Um, but the latest plan seemed to show that there would be one garage space, one space behind that, and then another space next to that on each lot. So uh, will there be on-street parking or has that been eliminated? I can actually answer that. There is the ability for on-street parking. They actually provided some off-street parking. It's on-street parking spaces. They've kind of grouped some of them as well. Um, and, I, and I believe the road is wide enough to allow for on-street parking on one side of the road at a minimum. Well, I, I really want to know if there's the three parking spaces on each lot. Yeah, as designed, it'll it'll allow for three parking spaces, um, one in the garage and then in the driveway. And then there's still the ability to have parking on the street and then they provided additional off-street parking spaces. Well, I think that considering the width of the lots, that two spaces on the lot outside the garage on each lot is going to make a horrible streetscape for this subdivision. I mean, when you, when you drive down the street, all you're going to see is parked cars. You know, you're not gonna see the front door. You, there's no front garden. Um, I just think it's um, not a good design. Uh, and it, it may well meet the city code, but I think it's not um, um, appropriate. All right, we can come back to that point at the at the uh, time that we're going to be hearing entertaining a motion to approve, disapprove, whatever, or set conditions. So you can re-raise that. Do you have other questions for Mr. Sutton? And let's see if, if Ron can and address them for you. Okay. Um, there there is a, a a wall, a retaining wall, indicated on the plans at the end of one of the cul-de-sacs, but there was no detail that I could find in the plans for the, the uh, retaining wall. And I wondered what material that's going to be. Can I be here? It, it, okay, I didn't know if I was unmuted yet or not. Um, so the retaining wall is approximately 20 feet long. It is to hold up the edge of the road along the edge of the uh, floodplain so we don't impact any um, development within the floodplain as we had promised all along. It is a proposed concrete retaining wall. It has a railing that will come up um, from the outside and protect it. It's up against the sidewalk. Um, that was one of the last things that we um, tweaked based on GMB's requirements. It is only 2.1 feet tall. It, it's almost going to be invisible when it, it's said and done. It's just needed because we did not have the room to slope back down without interfering the floodplain as we had promised. Okay, so you will be adding the, the details for that wall? The, those details are on the plans, oh. um, uh, Commissioner. Um, I believe it's, it's, a, it's on the grading plan. It's because it's, it's such a small detail. It's its own little detail on the grading plan. Okay, thank you. So I actually have a question that may follow up on on that. Um, we're talking the cul-de-sac on the end of Red Cedar Drive. Uh, and uh, two questions. One, I'm trying to understand, and actually the other cul-de-sac on, uh, what's it called, River Birch Drive. They, I may not be reading the map right. I know I've been called out on this before, but it, 
almost looks like the water is going to be flowing off the ends of these cul-de-sacs into that steep slope, you know, basically over that wall into the, the floodplain in both cases. Um, can you help me understand how the water is going to work coming down the roads? Because they both look like they slope to the cul-de-sac. Well, the, it, everything slopes to the cul-de-sacs, but we also have catch basins at the tail end of those cul-de-sacs to pick up all of the water. Every improvement that we have made, we are capturing and putting into that bioretention pond that we designed through either pipes or, um, or swales. In most cases, we have the, a pipe system. So, um, uh, Drew, I don't know what order you have in mind here if, if we're trying to cover topics. I mean, I have several things related to the floodplain and sea level rise. I don't know when it's appropriate to bring them up. Well, let me, Joe's been waiting to ask a question, Sumner. Let's come back to that in a minute. Yeah, um, way back in the pre-COVID days, uh, the Reverend Mark Harris and I did a walk through the site and I had noted down, we had some site concerns, basically housekeeping and cleanup. And I'm wondering what, would this be a potential condition? It's, it's not a requirement, but I say a condition to uh, clean up some of the debris on site to protect the future kids that may be exploring there. When do you see that's this being appropriate? Are you, is that a question for me? Oh, no. Yes, I think so. Um, I don't know that I actually have an answer for you. I apologize. Um, all I can tell you is we had okay. promised to stay out of the floodplain. Uh, it sounds like you're asking me to go into the floodplain now and, and do some, <laughs> some work. And, you know, I don't know how to answer. Well, that. Let, me, let, me, let me describe here. When the Reverend Harris and I went through there, we went along parallel to Canary Creek, went in clockwise. And as I described to him, I live nearby. And at night, I've seen taillights disappearing into the woods. I mean, you could find broken bottles, beer cans, and who knows what else in, in the brambles there. And there's an old trailer, there's, there's car tires. I mean, you just walk in parallel to the creek. I don't want to say it's a junkyard, but it really is, needs some cleanup. So, I mean, and there's invasive things hanging off the trees, dragging the trees down. You know, it, it needs a good touch there. I, I know... <laughs> You don't want to disturb the wetlands, but there's some dangerous stuff in there that needs to be cleaned up before children start exploring. So I'm and, gonna. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I don't know anticipate. How, who handles this? I'm gonna anticipate, um, and I have unmuted their attorney, Mr. Fuquay, um, and he can correct me if I am wrong. But I'm gonna guess as they work on developing the site there if they find things that are not appropriate for a new residential development that they're going to clean them up as as they work on on, uh, on developing the site um, so I'm going to guess that they will be addressed at the time of development as a development occurs and as they come across those items yeah Janelle can you hear me yes Janelle can you hear me yes oh, okay good uh, as Janelle would tell you, I'm not exactly technologically advanced. The, the uh, that this is a little bit new to me because I wasn't aware that the uh, that this this issue. Um, obviously, we've been focused on the development and complying with the code, and the area down around the creek, as I recall, we're giving an easement to the city. But I think uh, certainly it's a good point. And I think uh, the, develop the developer with the city could coordinate a cleanup plan on what needs to be done in there. So I think if, if you'd make that a recommendation of your approval, I think would be appropriate. I could, I could do that. And uh, I would invite anybody who wants to take a walk with me, bring your boots and uh, give me a call and I'll, I'll show, do a show and tell. Uh, yeah, the thing that I'll say disturbs me about this entire project is 
the houses are very dense. The open space is all wet. So there's, if someone lives in this place, they can go downstairs, they can go down, they can walk out in the streets, they can walk on new road, but, you know, 10 feet past the backyard, their socks are gonna get wet. And it, it surprised me, uh, maybe it's the way it's done, that all that, uh, that open space can be wet and um, uh, called open space when it's really marsh. It, uh, this is Jim. Oh, sorry, if you quit again. Uh, the uh, obviously the wetlands are, are wetlands, but what was done on this, which was not required, was that the floodplain was totally left alone. Uh, you can build in the floodplain. Uh, you just have to meet the requirements uh, as far as elevations. In this case, it was decided to stay completely outside of the floodplain. So the open area requirements are more than just wetlands. Um, and I, 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 just a point, um, <laughs> we're here tonight under the, what plan said was to determine whether the application's complete and some of these items, quite frankly, seem to be getting back to site design. And again, I'm respectfully just wondering whether that's things that we could get into at this point. As was mentioned, the, the preliminary approval or preliminary cons consent was 20 months ago, although it seems like it was about five years ago, quite frankly, with everything that's happened this past year. Uh, but uh, again, uh, everything in this plan meets the code. Well, unless Glenn disagrees with me, I think the only point, Mr. Fuqua, is that while you may have technically complied with all of the requirements, which the commission has yet to determine, um, there are conditions that still can be forwarded for Mayor and City Council consideration since we're just making a recommendation. So some of these matters may warrant that as was um, discussed a moment ago about the coordinated cleanup with the city. But um, I think we're reviewing the details to come to some understanding about what we're approving and then deciding whether or not as we make an approval vote or not, if there are some conditions that apply. I don't think they're onerous at the moment, the questions. And I think we should make sure that every commissioner has a chance to address any concerns that they have we started out by making sure that we understood the framework within which we can legally consider this matter. And we're going to stick to that. Uh, but within those boundaries, um, I think there are many legitimate questions that can be forthcoming. And uh, we're hearing some of them now. So I want to make sure every commissioner has a chance. Bob, do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share? No, not at this time. All right, Nancy, we haven't heard from you. Do you have any questions or uh, points you'd like to raise for consideration? No, I'd, I'd just like to uh, echo Bob's concern, but perhaps uh, position it in the context of, I think as we're looking at our definition of open space, uh, this is something that we need to be looking at uh, as we move forward. Good suggestion, good suggestion. I, I believe Mr. Sun might be able to answer a question or two. Um, um, he, yeah, I wanted to, yeah, go ahead. You know, we have a pretty detailed landscape plan in the plan package that shows a trail network that pretty much travels the entire perimeter of the project. Um, it, it goes around the, uh, the, the buyer retention pond. The buyer retention pond is not a uh, one of your ponds that's just going to be filled with water and you're going to have geese. It's, it's going to have landscaping and flowers and plants and I mean, it's a pretty intense operation. Uh, I believe we have gazebos, we've got um, uh, park benches. And, and you know, as Mr. Fuqua said, <clears throat> we did say out of that floodplain, that floodplain is not always going to be wet. The farmer uh, uh, actually plows that field now. There's a very large distance between where our pond drains to the edge of the woods 
I mean, for years that could be, you know, open space and usable for the, for the residents. It will only be wet when we have a storm event. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sutton. Any other questions for them at this point? Um, I notice our city manager's on. Anne Marie, do you have any questions that um, either to pose to uh, Mr. Fuqua, or Mr. Sutton, or for the commission to consider? No, I don't. Thank you. I, I actually have um, a, a question that relates to what, what Mr. Sutton was just talking about. I agree that, and, and I appreciate what you guys have done to stay out of the floodplain. Given all the work that we've had going on, looking at future scenarios of sea level rise, um, I think there will come a time, like there is, like there will come a time in any number of other places around the city where what was once a sort of an impossible event may very well become a once in a while event and eventually a, a somewhat regular event. Those are all in the future. Um, the question I has have has to do with those two ends of the um, cul-de-sacs and the slopes that are created, particularly the retaining wall, if a storm were to reach the base of that retaining wall, would it affect it? Would it be fine? Would it be able to handle the water that might come in? I realize that I, no storms have gotten there yet, but at some point in the future, we might expect that. That retaining wall is not going to be an issue. Again, it, it, it's, it's only 2.1 feet tall. I designed it as if it was 100% inundated. Um, it is not going to fail. Great. Melanie, you had a question? Yes, uh, I wondered what the pump station is going to look like. It, there was, I did see the detail of it, but it was just sort of a blank face. It, so the pump station, um, we went round and round on the pump station with GMB. Um, we are, uh, it will have substantial screening it will have a fence system around it. Um, it'll look just like a driveway coming off the end of the cul-de-sac to two little parking spots so that the uh, city personnel can go in there and do what they need to do with the pump station. We actually designed the pump station to be, um, to take seawater uh, rise into consideration. I originally had it put at about 500, the 500 foot elevation, which by the way, Getting that elevation is almost impossible, so you got to try and interpolate it. So we took that 500-year elevation and then also added additional sea level rise. So that pump station, I do not anticipate ever being inundated in a flood. All right. Uh, Councilperson Osler, do you have any questions or guidance that you wish to raise at this time? Uh no, I mean, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to what the commissioners have been saying. Okay. Well, so liaison, I want to make sure that we don't miss an opportunity to get your wise counsel. All right, commissioners, um, are there more matters that we need to raise with either Mr. Fuqua, Mr. Sutton, or Mr. O'Donnell at this point, or are we... Sumner? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, That's all right. Uh, uh, on the, the roadway, street, uh, pedestrian stuff, first of all, I want to commend you guys for the work that you've done with the Byways Committee. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not speaking for the Byways, but I know that you've worked with them and have put together what looks like a very nice plan along the roadway. Uh, and I assume that Del Dot will continue that shared use path across Canary Creek. My question has to do with the crosswalk, I'll call it across new road that will, I guess, tie into the Tower Hill development. Is there a plan for anything other than the white stripes that are indicated on the map? Is there any kind of a signage that will say, sort of like what happens on Old Orchard Road or Savannah Road where the Georgetown Lewis Trail Pass? You know, something can, that will help people understand that, that, you know, there's people coming across this. <clears throat> yes, I can, I can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I can talk in depth on this one because it has been a little bit of a thorn. So when you do a crosswalk across the main road, you actually have to, there, there's a detailed spreadsheet you fill all this data into that has to do with people and timing and the amount uh, or how fast people walk across the street. So because new road is gonna be a pretty wide road, a simple crosswalk was not permissible. 
Um, and we did not want signals and things of that nature because that affects the whole, you know, um, new road corridor. So we are installing a splitter island in which the uh, pedestrians will be able to come to the edge of the road, walk across one lane of traffic. Now, now they have safe harbor within this splitter island and then walk across the other lane of traffic and get to the multimodal, I'm sorry, shared use path that is going to be part of the Tower Hill project. What, it is, what sometimes it is, it's called a, a refuge island, I think, something like that? Yes. Yes, okay. and then, but this this is um, it, it's a refuge island for the pedestrians. It's a splitter island for the traffic. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Um, I, I have a, a, another sea level rise related question that has to do with the buyer retention basin, um, as well as um you know we we've had uh, a bunch of discussions um i guess because tom's not here i get to i get to carry the weight on this we've had a bunch of discussions in the city there's been a lot written in the papers lately about you know sea level rise and groundwater and so on and um uh two questions i have have to do with you know as the sea level rises it, uh, the, G the Delaware Geological Survey has indicated to us that we should expect that groundwater, the water table underneath most sites that are near tidal waters, will rise uh, as well. Um, and I'm I'm just wondering how that might, how you think that might affect the bioretention basin, as well as the the back lots. Um, uh, what are they? Forty seven to sixty nine. Um, Judging from the slopes that are back there, I'm assuming that the, the buildings will be built basically at or above the elevation of the, the fronts of the houses, the street side, and they'll have big uh, posts holding them up in the back, unless there's a solid foundation. I don't, what, what's the plan with those houses? Oh, uh, it's, 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 an, it's anticipated that these houses will be built like standard construction. Um, there's no pilings needed. Um, we have, uh, I believe, out in the, the front of that road, I'm going by memory here, um, I think I'm at about an elevation 10 out on the road. Um, we always progress back up another um, two feet so that the, I'm guessing the finished floors for those houses are going to be around elevation 12. Um, and then the, the house comes back and then we would probably slope down and have maybe an elevation 10 in, in the back. Um, I, I don't have the grading plan in front of me. I apologize. Um, uh, as far as the bioretention uh, basin is concerned, it is designed with, according to the DENREC regulations, it has a one foot of freeboard built into it. If I'm not mistaken, I think I have a little bit more, like 1.25 of freeboard built into it. Um, I don't anticipate any 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 issues to tell you the truth. I don't think those houses have anything to worry about as far as sea, sea level rise, and you know stormwater basins. You know, we design them by the current code. I can't I don't I can't really take additional things into consideration. They can be modified in the future. They're not, you know, one hundred percent permanent items. They can, they can be cleaned. They can be modified. They can be changed over if and when something occurs. So Ron, I'm just gonna help answer that question because I had, was able to look at the grading plan or the landscape panel that has the grading and they're going from like 14 back down to 12 or 13 down to 11 um, for, the, for the grading of the property. Okay, so we got a significant difference between the floodplain and, and, and sea level rise. We even have a buffer between sea level rise All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, are we prepared then to entertain a motion to approve, disapprove the final site plan with or without conditions? And Glenn, I take it ultimately we're going to need what I'll call a recorded vote by commissioner. That's right, thanks Mr. Chair. 
Do I have anybody willing to proffer a motion to see if we have a second and we can have further discussion? While you're thinking about it, for your assistance, the, the two con possible conditions that I heard were no building permit being issued prior to issuance of an entrance permit. And secondly, the developer shall coordinate a site cleanup with the city to remove debris and trash not appropriate to a residential subdivision. Now, Charlie had two, I think, um, issues to be addressed. I don't know whether they're actually conditions or not. Charlie, you want to speak to sheet R2 and to the um, street uh, sheet R4? Okay. Uh, Pages six and seven. Yeah. Um, let's see. Sheet R2. I, I think that's something that should probably be added to the conditions. It shouldn't take much effort to find that out about who's responsible for maintenance of the catch basins on a new road, whether it's Deldot or the developer. It's Deldot right away. Yeah. It's going to be Deldot. And I, and I believe we added the, the requirement, but that, that's certainly okay to find out, you know. Yeah, I, I figure that. it would be Deldot, but it, I, don't, I don't see where that's noted anywhere. So we just wanted to make sure. Okay. Not a problem, Charlie. And then your temporary easement, Charlie? Okay, Ms. Can... Oh, yeah, so um, this is just something that we wanted to bring to your attention at the uh, west side of River Birch Drive. They've got the right of way moving straight through to serve the uh, adjacent property if it were ever to be developed in a road with connection was necessary, which was a condition early on in this project that they're meeting. Um, the cul-de-sac itself refers to um, the, the rounded portion of the cul-de-sac um, as easement. So it's, it's, it's not actual right away, it's an easement. So I just wanted to make sure that we brought that to your attention um, as a planning commission. And your, your notation is that it should re reflect temporary easement to be abandoned upon street interconnection. Yes, I, I, yes, that is our recommendation. Okay. Actually, I, I do have another question from Charlie's. I'm looking through it now. There's an item on, I think it's page seven. It refers to, it's, it's number, number two, it says sheet G1. And it talks about the rights of way along Canary Creek Drive. There seems to be some sort of overlap in there and I'm just curious how that's to be resolved. It seems like there's a right there's a right of way maybe for utility purposes um, that that this this applicant is seeking that looks like it overlaps with the right of way that the Canary Creek Drive residents have to access their yeah. houses on the other side there. Yeah, that is true. There's a the proposed re re residential buffer that's required overlaps onto that right of way from Canary Creek Drive. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I'm just bringing that to your attention. I can explain that if I can, I might, okay. So that is a private right-of-way that was established back when those three lots were constructed. That private right-of-way has always been owned and maintained by the Birmingham's. It was just for the use of getting to those three lots. Maybe they had anticipated doing, you know, three lots on the other side at a later date, but that never took place. Our, um, the applicant has worked very um, hard with the three neighbors there. They wanted that buffer pushed into that private right away so that they could have a, burn, a landscape berm to kind of separate them and provide a nice um, landscaped feature for them. We, we also added um, a catch basin at the end of that private right away to collect that water with, and, and run it through our stormwater management system. So we are provide, we're trying to accommodate the neighbors. The private right of way is still in ownership of Brittingham. So we, we could vacate that very easily and, and, and turn something into an easement, but we decided that it was probably best to leave it alone, put in the buffer as requested, put in the additional landscaping, 
and then handle the stormwater through our stormwater pond, which in, in essence, we could have just bypassed according to, to, to state regulations, but it just made more sense to pull everything in. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I didn't know any of that. You couldn't tell that from the records here. I, thank you for, the, for your answer. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Ron. No problem. All right, are we, Glenn, if you're keeping score, I think we now have four potential conditions. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so the two additional ones, Mr. Chair, um, as to sheet R2, which is page six, um, there'd be a notation made on the record plan that the maintenance of the catch basins on New Road would be Delgado's responsibility. And then on sheet R4, which is page seven, the west side of River Birch Drive, um, the rounded portion of the rounded portion of the cul-de-sac is identified as an easement, which would which is to be abandoned upon connection. That notation should be on the plan as well. Yeah, identified on the plan as a temporary easement. Correct. All right, I come back to the other commissioners. Is there a motion to Joe? I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion for approval of the final subdivision plan for the Lewis Waterfront Preserves located off a of new road, zoned AX Res, County Tax Map 335-8.00-17.0. Is that a amend? Does that motion for any approval? Does that your motion include any conditions? It includes condition. Yes. Those four conditions. Yes, my internet service is going blinky. So. Right. Oh, we just thought it was you. All right. right. <laughs> is there a second to the motion? So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this. I, I wasn't part, I wasn't there for the first vote. Um, and if I understand, we are not here to relitigate uh, everything that might have been discussed at that meeting. And since I wasn't there, I, I, I can't recommend denial based on the things I might have said back then. As I understand things, the applicant has done everything we've asked, given these couple of things that we've just we've just discussed. Um, I, uh, along with Melanie and some of the things that uh, uh, Melanie uh, suggested earlier, I'm not particularly happy with it. But I guess, in the spirit of not holding this up, I, I you know, I'm not a, I'm not terribly comfortable with seconding, but I, but I would if nobody else does. Accept your second for the purpose of continuing the discussion on this motion. Yeah. Um, and you still have the opportunity to vote up or down on the motion. And I'll second it. Sumner, the purpose of my um, imposing on both Glenn and Janelle at the beginning was to address exactly the point that you're raising since most of the commissioners were not part of the earlier decision. Um, we have a legal framework within which we have to exercise our judgment. And while most of us have questions or concerns, we really have a, a code, AX Res, that we have to apply to this situation. And there are enumerated criteria in the code for approval. And um, this is not stepping up to be executed. You know, here's your last cigarette. We're going to go to the firing squad. But this is, in fact, our duty, I believe, as commissioners. To apply the law as we've read it, as Glenn has reiterated it, <coughs> with the details that we have in the record and that Jen, uh, Janelle highlighted. Um, personally, I don't like 84 townhouses. I don't think that's what we should be putting in there, but that's what's allowed under the AX res. And I'm, I, I think we have to vote on what we have before us within the parameters of the code and the regulations that exist that apply to this particular project and may not apply to any other project. This may be a one-off. This may be a one and done. Uh, Looks like Melanie's got a question. Drew froze up. You froze it, Drew. I would like to add another condition for approval. 
uh, for safety purposes, I would suggest that, or I would recommend that um, the two parking spaces shown at each unit um, in front of the unit, not in the garage, be limited to one parking space uh, for the safety of the pedestrians who will be walking behind those vehicles. So while, while Drew is, or while the chairperson is frozen, that, that would be in the form of an amendment to the motion then. So um, she's made a motion then to amend um, the current motion. And is there somebody who is willing to second that? So oh, I will. Mr. Hefferman, I, seconded? Yes. Is, uh, just a question, does that, does that, um, does that work within our code and our, our requirements for parking per lot? Potentially, I, I haven't done the math or reviewed it to make sure that it still complies, even though it, it there's the potential to get two parking spaces on, which is the code requirement. I, I just can't say yes or no without actually looking at a plan and reviewing it 100%. Well, as I would see it, there would be one space in the garage and one space behind that. So there would be two on-site parking spaces. You know, we, we are allowed to stack the spaces. They don't have to be side by side. Yeah. Well, there isn't room to do that, is there? Well, one in the driveway. The driveway one. doesn't allow that. Yeah, it, it, does this when, when we talk about stacking? Does it include the space in the garage? Yes. Okay. Just one question: Would that cause the, the stacked car, the one that's not in the garage, to overlap the sidewalk? I don't. I don't have the measurements in front of me. I don't know either. Perhaps Mr. Sutton's able to answer that. We're losing people. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So my understanding of the current code is it's two off-street parking spots per unit. We designed this with with the two parking um, areas in the front. Um, one would most likely be um, the impervious type pavers to limit impervious. Um, but we designed this so that we could have three parking spots off of the street because parking was an original concern with the commission. Um, that's why we did it that way. That would leave eight feet between the edge of the parking drive <clears throat> and the um, for, for, for a lead walk up to the front of the house. The parking would be very similar to the um, to the townhomes that are over on Canary, the other subdivision across the street. Um, I forget the name. Canary <clears throat> Creek. Canary Creek, yes. Off uh, of Park. Yeah, so we've modeled this after similar <clears throat> products. These are 28 foot wide townhomes. There's plenty of space. Um, I, I, I understand your concern about safety, um, but, but this is a, it will be a residential subdivision. And I think if we don't have, or the, the ability to put that, that second parking area that you're gonna have issues with parking on the street. At this point, Commissioner, I think we should take a short recess while we try to establish connection with the chairperson again. I, so I the chair has, that's why I lost videos. The chair has reached out and he is desperately trying to get back in. He's having some computer problems um, and wanted me to let you know that Melanie would then be in um, as the next in line for the commission um, could run the meeting until he can get back in. And he is he is working on that. Then we will not take a recess unless he wants to be present to hear the conversation. He said to continue moving forward if we if we could. Um, Glenn, do we have enough members is my next question. Well, there's a good question. I can see one, two, three, I four, five members in a nine member commission. I, and then I, I, I feel in some ways that history repeats itself, doesn't it? Yes, because then my next question was the voting process and the per the bylaws. Yeah, I want to um, bring the bylaws up and make sure that we're 
um, in compliance and we'll get to them. So do you want to take five minutes or 10 minutes, Glenn? I, I, I can, I ask, can I ask a question of Mr. Sutton while we're waiting? I'm here. Um, the the uh, FEMA letter of map revision or amendment or whatever, was that basically just to adjust to a finer level seven foot elevation line? Is that what you guys did? Yes, it's called a LOMA, which is a letter of map amendment. So when, when FEMA does their studies, they don't really use detail. Sometimes they use it, but when, when they actually identify the elevation, they don't go out and survey and locate that elevation seven. So what we did is we went out and identified elevation seven all around the perimeter of our site. And then we file a document, which is the LOMA, um, and then FEMA agrees with that. And then the map is actually changed to follow elevation seven per FEMA's flood study of the area. In some cases it helps you, in some cases it hurts you. So we, you know, we lost some land. If we would have followed the graphical, um, we, we probably would have had, you know, some areas that we could have been working in, but to do it right, you want to file your LOMA, you want to set your floodplain on your job and then go from there. Thank you. Where are we? I think we're on recess. Yeah, I, I'm looking at the, the bylaws now. It looks to me as though one of the changes that was made recently is you know, voting shall be by majority, it says. No action may be taken unless at least a quorum of commission members duly cast a vote to approve or deny a motion. If a roll call is requested, the chair shall vote last. So as a nine member commission, there would need to be five members actually voting. And we have right now on the screen, I see five up oh, and Drew's Drew's back. Drew's back. He's, we're glad to see you, Drew. <laughs> I'm sorry that this is the best I can do. Um, we only, uh, when you say we only have five, Glenn, I thought we were seven of us present. There were, you, you dropped off, so I was not counting you at the time. And I see on my screen right now, one, two, three, four, five, six. We're at six because Kay has recused herself. Yeah, Kay's right. recused. Yeah. Right. So where we are, Mr. Chair, um, while you were gone, uh, Ms. Mosner made a motion to amend the motion. So recall the original motion yes. is to approve with the four conditions. She made a motion to amend that motion uh, with an additional condition that would say um, for, pur for safety purposes, the two spaces shown um, per unit on the plan uh, of not garage parking, um, of off street parking would be limited to one space. And so we've had some questions and that was seconded um, by Mr. Heffernan. And there's been some questions about whether that sort of an arrangement would, would be um, possible under the current code and as, and as the plan is currently configured. So Mr. Sutton was talking somewhat to that. He remarked that um, Part of the reason the plan was done the way it is is because the members of the planning commission as it existed previously were concerned about off-street parking and having enough off-street parking. And that's partly the reason that this plan is, is the way it currently is uh, constructed. So is there a, a legal reason why that uh, amendment would not be um, possible to proffer and to adopt? Janelle and I have sort of talked through it a little bit here with some assistance for Mr. Sutton, and, and we don't know of anything, nothing immediate comes to mind that would not allow that amendment um, to be part of this recommendation. Yeah, Obviously, just, we'll have, go ahead, Janelle. Sorry, I'm apologies for interrupting. I can just see it being difficult to enforce, just, you know, 20, 30 years down the road when somebody wants to widen their driveway or something. So... Well, is the motion to narrow the driveway or just to suggest there's only the garage parking in one space? The amendment that I propose is that there be garage space and one space outside. <clears throat> but does that include narrowing the driveway? Yes. Okay, just yeah. want to make clear because if it stays the same, there, there'll be multiple cars parked in the driveway. So it's a little bit more than just one and one. It's a narrowing of the driveway. Right. Okay. Is there further discussion? Anne-Marie actually has her hand up. 
I, I do want to also just raise the, if, if there are, if there's enough room for a second car to park in the driveway without overhanging the sidewalk, I think it's going to be very hard for the city to enforce that condition. Um, and and I, I doubt that the HOA, that that's something that the HOA would actively enforce. Well, it, it, would, be, it would be my opinion that um, the driveway is going to be constructed with the townhouse that's being built and it will be so wide. And um, I, I just don't see a lot of people wanting to add that much pavement to their front yard. But if I understand, Melanie, what you're suggesting is instead of side by side, there would only be room for one car in the narrower driveway. Correct. So that it's, it, to Anne Marie's point, they wouldn't be um, in sequence. They would, they would, under the current plan, the spaces are side by side. In your proposal, there wouldn't be any room behind the one car in the driveway because it would overlap the sidewalk or the driveway into the street because you're eliminating the second parking space. Correct. Okay. I, I do think it's an it's a potential enforcement question. Um, two spaces do comply with the code, correct, Glenn? Correct. So, so uh, I, I just the amendment to the proposed recommendation. Yeah. Um, just the uh, uh, Mr. Sutton mentioned using um, Canary Creek. Now, granted, this is no scientific process, but I, just while we were talking, I looked at Google Maps and it definitely looks like the driveways in Canary Creek are two car wide driveways that are pretty similar to what I imagine the applicant is asking for here. Uh, Commissioner Moser, I, I share your concern um, about the general safety and also the aesthetics of having a bunch of cars filling the street and the, we'll call it the streetscape for lack of a better term. Um, you know, when you drive down these roads, you're gonna just see a lot of cars and by the way, there'll be buildings behind them and a couple of trees in there. Um, I, I, th I think largely the opportunity to control that we gave away when we, when we form the AX res ordinance the way it lies. I, I, I kind of feel like we need to leave it the way it is. I, I mean, I guess my worry is the cars will just end up on the street. Will they be any better in terms of safety if they're in the street? I can't answer that. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, I am concerned about the pedestrian who's walking behind two parked cars. You know, the, the driver can't see beyond his sec the second car there. And I think it's an, we're, we would be approving an unsafe condition for the pedestrian. Any other commissioner have a comment on the amendment? My, my, my concern is um, where those cars will end up going. And, and I think they will be parked on the street. And that creates in, in many ways a, a different safety issue in terms of children dock, darting out you know, between cars, et cetera, uh, in, into the street. Um, I, I understand the concern about the aesthetics, but our rules right now are not about those aesthetics. And um, I'm, I'm not sure that we're not just shifting a, a safety issue as opposed to uh, addressing it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we, you know, we have the rules that we need to follow and that's, uh, at times that can be troubling, I think, for some of us, but. Uh, Bob, but, do you have any thoughts or comments before we take a vote? Well, I guess mine are, if you narrow the driveways, you do pick up some grass or other plantings and on the streetscape that can make, turn this from something I would find pretty unattractive uh, to something that might be more attractive. Um, we, we can't really make this argument 
on on aesthetics. It, it's got to be health, safety, and welfare. Uh, I and, understand that. Um, and I, I, again, I think the pedestrian has a right to walk on a sidewalk without being in danger of being run over. And I think that two cars parked side by side uh, really restricts the driver's view. And I, I understand about parking on the street, but I'm talking strictly about the pedestrian who is legally and should be safely on the sidewalk. No. Uh, I'd like to point out, even on my little Prius, which is about three or four years old, I have a dashboard cam and I can look in my over my shoulders or look at my dashboard screen and on all the newer SUVs, you've got cameras all over the place showing up on your dashboard. I think pedestrians have never been as safe as they are now. And it's gonna be a lot cleaner look to have the cars side by side in a driveway rather than as Nancy pointed out, having little kids darting out between cars parked along the curb. But cars in the driveway with cameras are safe. All right, this is a vote on amendment. I'm gonna call the question. And we don't need a roll call on this, correct, Lynn? We just need a showing of hand. That's right. All right. So the proposed amendment is to reduce the size of the driveway to allow for one car parking at each of the locations. All in favor, show by raising your hand, please. I see two votes in favor. All opposed? So it's four, two to four, the, the amendment fails. Um, are there other amendments that anyone wishes to propose? We have the question then of the amendment to approve the final site plan with four conditions. Um, I'm gonna call the question unless there are any comments or questions. All right, I'm gonna to move to calling the question. This will be a roll call vote. You can adopt the previous commissioner's point of view, explain yours, add to it. Uh, and I'm gonna start with the sponsor, Joe. Uh, I'm voting to approve my own amendment, my own uh, motion. It's, uh, it's a project that's almost in my backyard. Um, I, uh, I believe in townhouses. I think this, this is overdue to bring some uh, reasonably priced housing to this area. And uh, I'm in favor of it. Sumner? Uh, I am reluctantly seconding the motion with the um, uh, conditions as stated. Yeah. Um, I wasn't here to vote when the original vote was cast but I do believe that we have a process that we need to follow. Um, I think the property, I think the plan is out of character with the neighborhood. And um, I guess all I'll say is that I hope that this is in fact a one-off. I don't really think this fits where it, where it is. There are places perhaps in Lewis where we could do this, but I don't think on the edge of the city is the place, but I believe in the process and I think the, applicant has has put forth a good faith effort to meet all of our conditions and do what we've asked of them so thank you melanie and i just real quick um ask that sumner is voting in favor of the motion because you said you were seconding I said it I, so I am voting in favor i'm okay thank you voting in favor i thank just you. wanted that for thank the you. record thank you melanie please I defer for the moment. Okay, Bob, she's passing in other words. Bob? Uh, so, uh, sort of doubling on Sumner's comments, I'm, I'm voting in favor and I'm terribly unenthusiastic about this happening. Nancy? Uh, I'm voting in favor. Um, I think they, the applicant has complied with all of the requirements. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, it's my responsibility then to, to vote in favor. Um, but I hope as someone who's uh, newer on this uh, commission uh, and wasn't here when it, when it was originally looked at, uh, that we 
take some lessons from this as we're reviewing things like the definition of open space and uh, some of the other uh, requirements. Thank you, Nancy. Melanie, I come back to you. Okay, well, in, in good conscience, I really feel I cannot vote for this, uh, vote in favor of this, um, because I, I believe that um, the, there is a, a health, safety, and, and uh, welfare issue on the plan. All right. Um, I am fortunate enough to articulate to have Nancy articulate my thoughts better than I could have. Um, and the concerns that other commissioners have expressed, I share. Unfortunately, I was not able to be present and vote the last time, even though I was on the commission. Um, but I do reluctantly vote in favor of the final site plan. Um, I think that the applicant has has tried uh, reasonably well to answer the questions that have come up and to prepare a site plan in accordance with the code that governs that um, project at this time. I do think as Nancy said so well, we do need to look more deeply into these areas going forward. Uh, I think it's important that we um, try to improve uh, for everyone's benefit, the decision-making process and the results um, to protect all of us from, for a variety of reasons. Melanie, while I don't think aesthetics is our job, I certainly agree with your concerns about the structure of the um, streets and the parking and other things. Bob, I agree with you that having more pervious surface would be an improvement, but I don't think those are sufficiently uh, controlling for my determining that we should not recommend uh, this plan be approved with the four conditions. So um, as Sumner said, a reluctant, reluctant second and voter, as I think others have said, I'm a reluctant yes, uh, given the statutory constraints that Glenn outlined, given the requirements and what Janelle outlined for us at the beginning. Um, I don't think our ability to um, challenge the code uh, pertains here. We have to change the code, not challenge it. We have to make it better in the future so we don't put ourselves in a position of having to vote on something like this that is at best a lukewarm or worse uh, taste in all of our mouths. So that's not a reflection on the Mr. Fuqua, Mr. Sutton or their client. That's a reality of what we think the city of Lewis deserves as a planning uh, instrument going forward as the guidelines for building and, we th and I am voting in favor because I think they've done their job to meet the requirements that are there now, albeit ones that uh, are not in favor by a majority of the commission. So by my count, it's a five to one vote, which carries the recommendation to go forward to Marin City Council for which there'll be a public hearing. Uh, and then Marin City Council will be making the final decision uh, before August 19th of this year. Any other comments on this? If not, I'm going to move on to the next item on the agenda. All right, new business, presentation and discussion of possible recommendation to Marin City Council regarding parcel consolidation for the lands of Gottwald and Hardin located at 618 Kings Highway, Sussex County tax map 335-8.15-37.00, and 37.01. Uh, this is like Groundhog Day, deja vu all over again. Here we go. Separate, rejoin. And now we're trying to rejoin. Janelle, do you want to give us an overview, please? So this application is was previously subdivided in 2018. Um, the, uh, the new owners are looking to, or the owners are looking to combine the two properties back into one parcel. The property is zoned R4H. Um, so the lot as, as existing, the two lots meet the code requirements. So combining them back will meet and exceed the code requirements for a lot size and dimensions and requirements. Um, the property is not located within the floodplain. Um, property is currently, it, provided um, with utilities. The, uh, the site plan or the, the architectural uh, amendment, the development of the site um, went to H Park. They did recommend approval of the plan. 
pending the parcel consolidation outcome. Um, so the property owner is looking to do expansions of the existing house, which is the reason they're looking to combine the lots back into one parcel um, so they can do that building expansion, which again, that was approved by H Park pending the parcel consolidation. So again, they're just trying to take two lots that were one about three years ago and put them back into one now. I welcome back our vice chair, uh, uh, otherwise known as short timer. Um, <laughs> Uh, Janelle, is it not correct that the neighbors were notified of this and there were no objections received? I have not received any objections that I, that I can Are recall. No questions on this matter? If not, do I have a motion? Up, oh, Sumner. So just to be clear, um, uh, if, if we approve this uh, application, there would only be one house on this property? Correct. Okay. All right, do I have a motion? I move to- Guys are shy guys tonight, come on. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Sam. No, no, go Nancy, ahead. Nancy, go ahead. I, I move to approve uh, this- um, Consolidation. Consolidation, sorry. I second. Melanie seconds, any further discussion? And just to be clear, it's a recommendation, not a, not a final approval. <laughs> right. Do we need a roll call vote on this or just a showing? Just as Sean will be fine on this one. Okay, all in favor show by raising your hand. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Let's move on to C2, presentation and discussion of possible recommendation to Marin City Council regarding a minor subdivision for the lands of Christine King located at 119 to 125 Schley Avenue, Sussex County tax map 335-8.00-13.00. Paren MS-1-21 closed paren. Again, Janelle, you want to give us an overview, please? I'd be happy to. Thank you. So this is a minor subdivision to create um, four residential lots off of Schley Avenue. The property is zoned R4. Um, it is not, I'm going to just clarify, is not in the historic district because um, there are properties in the area that are, but this one is not in the historic district. Um, so what they're looking to do is, is create four new lots. Um, as you note, uh, lot 16 does not meet the code requirements regarding lot frontage and width and or size. Um, the applicant did go to the Board of Adjustment and the Board of Adjustment did grant variances for those, those items. So if you do approve or recommend approval of the, the minor subdivision, please note that the Board of Adjustment has recognized the the and granted variances for that lot. Um, the lot, the property is not located within the in the floodplain and the Lewis Board of Public Works has indicated they have the ability to serve the proposed parcels with uh, utilities. Thank you. Are there any questions for Janelle or any questions for each other about this? Yeah, I have a question and uh, Janelle, did the property owner ever consider putting a, a block of uh, townhouses there? So townhouses are not permitted in the R4 zoning district. So they would not, I don't believe they would have ever considered that because it's not something that's permitted in the R4. Well, they could do the dirty word of spot zoning if they so considered. So again, their request tonight was just for a minor subdivision <laughs> to get the, the four lots. Oh, So that's that's what they they've asked for. Okay, is just the four lots um, in the R four zoning district. Is there any re reason it couldn't be three lots? Again, the request was four lots, and the board of adjustment has already determined that has already granted variances for a potential fourth lot. Is the requirement not that there be five thousand square foot per lot? Again, the code requirement is 5,000 square foot per lot. A variance was granted for lot 16 to be 4,552 square feet. So if you recommend approval, that lot is allowed per the Board of Adjustment to be less than 5,000 square feet and to have less than 50 feet of lot width and street frontage based on the variances granted by the Board of Adjustment. 
Bob, regardless of how we vote on this, I want to just say I think this is the appropriate way an application should come to us, having gone to the Board of Adjustment to get the yeah. variance before it comes to us um, and to have the benefit of their insight into the process. Whether we agree with their decision or not, I think it's important that this would be the pro appropriate way in the future to take up these matters. And Bob, I'll come back to you in a minute if you wish to offer an amendment. Sumner? Uh, do we receive any public comment on this? Not regarding the minor subdivision. I have not received comment. And I'm assuming that these lots, just looking quickly at a, at a tax map of the area, these lots will be a little smaller than the rest of the neighborhood, at least across the street. Maybe slightly, but they're in, again, one of the, the requirements for a variance is that it's in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. So okay. um, the lot sizes would be very similar to other lots in the area. And again, um, based on the code, they are, would be in compliance with the code requirements. Yep, fair enough. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Bob, do you want to make a motion? Well, if I made a motion, it would be to deny it uh, based on the um, all lots not being 5,000 square feet, which I understand they can't do with this geography. But your motion is really to approve three lots, not four. Is that correct? I'd be willing to approve, uh, amend this to three lots, yes. OK. Is there a second to his motion? Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I really think that would be an inappropriate motion. They, they, the application is for four lots. So I think you need to either approve what's been proposed or, or deny what, recommend denying what's been proposed. You can- I can recommend denial based on the issue that he, three lots. So it's the same, the semantics are the same. He's recommending disapproval because he's recommending three lots, not four. Correct. That, that would be an appropriate motion that recommend denial based upon the lot, the density versus, you know, what, what he thinks is- Is there a second to his motion? Seeing none, is there an alternative motion? Joe? I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, minor subdivision at 119-125 uh, Schley Avenue, Sussex County tax map, 335-8.08-133.00 into uh, four lots. Is there a second? Melanie, thank you. Is there any further discussion? Again, I think um, we can just, Joe? I just wanted to point out that visiting the site, as you look at it, you realize the lot on the, uh, Lot number 16, the property line is composed of an eight foot chain link fence with barbed wire. So it's, it's gonna be interesting. All right, I'm gonna call the question again, a showing of hands I think are sufficient at this Mr. point. Sure, on this one, just because I did watch the Board of Adjustment hearing and there, there was some limited opposition, I think I'd like to develop a little bit more of a record on your vote if you, if you would. All right, Thanks. council's advice. And we'll start again with the mover and shaker. Mr. Motion, Joe. Uh, yes, I I made the motion to approve, and um, I believe this will be a nice little minor subdivision here, of four small houses into a neighborhood where it will be very appropriate, um, as long as you ignore the water tower in the side yard. But uh, I vote to approve. Melanie is the seconder. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> You're muted, Ms. Moser. Sorry about that. Yes. Uh, I would concur with Joe uh, for his reasons that it's an appropriate subdivision and uh, would support it for that reason. Well, he also added that he thinks it's great that we have a water tower as a backyard object R for one of the lots. So um, okay, we're going to warm you up. Your, your chance. I will vote yes, um, as I will go with uh, supporting four lots here because the Board of Adjustment 
has uh, already ruled that it would be appropriate. All right, Sumner. Uh, I will vote yes uh, for all the reasons uh, mentioned so far. I think given its proximity to what I'll call downtown Lewis, I think it's 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 probably an appropriate uh, use of space. And just like Kay said, I, given that the Board of Adjustment has already decided it fits, I, I'm, I think we, we, we don't want to get in the way. Bob? I vote no, because the lots aren't 5,000 square feet. Nancy? I vote yes. And I appreciate that they've gone to the Board of Adjustment before bringing this forward here. And the chair votes yes. Uh, I think it is, again, appropriate that they've gone to the Board of Adjustment. I certainly see no reason to disagree with the Board of Adjustment. I think the four lots are a vast improvement over what's there now. And I think we'll fit in with the neighborhood. And um, I look forward to seeing the development come to fruition uh, at some time in the not too distant future. So it carries six to one as I record the vote. All right, may we move on to C3 then and C4, which are really companion items. And um, I don't think we have to take them up um, initially in discussing them separately. I think it's appropriate to combine the discussion about what we're looking at, and then we'll have to vote on them separately. But um, Janelle, you wanna lead us through the issue about the uh, dairy site. Thank you. So we received an application for a change of zone, which is item C4 for 660 Pilot Town Road. Um, but I'm gonna start with the, the future land use map because as, as I think everybody kind of knows, is our land use and our zoning need to match. So currently the property is zoned industrial and the land use is identified as industrial. So to move forward with the, the change of zone, the, there needs to be consideration to amend the future land use map of the comprehensive plan. And that would be for a consideration to amend the, the map from industrial land use to a residential land use. And that's what the comprehensive plan recommendation is. Um, it did go through the, the, the city took it through the, the state's plus process. Um, we are still awaiting the, the formal letter, but based on the meeting, no one had objections to the, the request to amend the, the map. Um, and again, it's for two different parcels. I'm going to note the parcels are land hooked across Pilot Town Road. None of these applications, C3 or C4, impact the area across Pilot Town Road. This is just for um, um, the properties kind of northwest um, side of Pilot Town Road. Um, so just for everybody's clarification, if it's got an open space land use classification and open space zoning, it is to remain that. We are only focusing on the industrial portion, which is the industrial land use to a residential land use. And then the applicant is requesting an amendment to the zoning code from industrial zone to the R2, which is the low density residential zone um, for development is potentially for a residential use. So um, again, the property is surrounded by institutional land use, residential land use, um, and it's also surrounded by um, um, uh, community facilities zoning and R2 residential zoning as well. And again, the pro the portion of across the street on Pilot Town Road is open space with an open space zoning. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. No. Uh, Janelle, do you know the approximate size of the industrial area that would be converted to R2? Give me just a minute. It's 2.73 acres. 2.73. Okay. Is it possible to estimate a, a yield? I mean, give some idea of the number of R2 lots that you could fit in there? Um, I'm going to say it's less than a dozen. Um, again, you've got to get stormwater management, open space, and a road to be designed. So I believe we're looking less than a, a dozen of potential lots. And again, we're looking at 10,000 square feet. Um, but again, I think the purpose is, does the R2 zoning district make the appropriate sense for the location of the property? Um, does the industrial continue to make sense for the location of the property? And does the, in, and then land use wise, um, 
does the residential land use make sense for the property and the surrounding properties? Any other questions or comments, Melanie? Is there any possibility that, that uh, the buildings are historic? The dairy's been there a long time. I think it's not in the historic district. Um, so that takes that from having to go to H Park. Um, that is something that they could look into. But again, today is just to focus on the, does it make sense to amend the land use map of the comp plan and does the um, R2 zoning make the appropriate sense for the property? Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a really interesting lot. And I'm assuming that the reason it was painted in that purple color on your map is simply because it was industrial. It had been industrial for a number of years. But as you said, there's, there's a, an, an assortment of land uses around that. As I remember, there's actually a graveyard on one side, isn't there? Right. Correct. So, so there's Catholic a graveyard, there's the University of Delaware, and then there's houses. Yes, um, and I would and I know if it's houses, I, I, would, I, would, I would say that R2 is the appropriate uh, designation. And the applicant's attorney is available if you have specific questions. Unless you have some industrial use for it and there's somebody who wants to go in there, what are you gonna do? Just keep, uh, it's, it's not being used um, in a way. So I think R2 is a better way. All right, I'm gonna, uh document the record for a moment and then we'll, I'll look for a motion. On C3, presentation, discussion, and possible recommendation of Mayor and City Council regarding amendment to the comprehensive plan future land use map to amend the land use classification for parcels 335-4.14-110 and 111.00 portions of from industrial to residential. This is item C3. Do we have a motion to make uh, such an amendment to the comprehensive plan future land use map. Sumner. I'll make that motion. Second. Any further discussion? Again, Glenn, are we going to be able to show hands on this or do you want a roll call? Mr. Chair, I'm so sorry, but if you if you just ask for a couple comments, I mean, if it can be as simple as residential makes sense in this area because it has residential. Glenn, whatever it is, mm -hmm. Glenn, don't apologize. Whatever it is we need to do. Yeah, it, I, I think so. Then you can incorporate your reasons in this one into the next vote. All right, Sumner. Uh, I move that we uh, reclassify uh, this parcel from uh, industrial to uh, R2. No, the residential on the map. Oh. It's a residential in the comprehensive okay. plan. Um, as I think that it's in keeping with the, the, the surrounding area and frankly is a better fit with the surrounding area than industrial. Nancy, you were second on this? Yeah, uh, I second it and vote in favor of this, uh, the reclassification. I think it makes sense and is the appropriate use uh, of that land uh, uh, for our uh, uh, overall planning. Okay, Bob? I vote in favor. Uh, it, it's better. It matches the uh, surrounding uh, properties and, in fact, extends residential houses out Pilot Town Road in, a, I in a, what I think is a good area. Thank you. Melanie? You're muted again. <laughs> All right. Well, I concur with the previous rationale and vote in favor. Thank you. Okay. I also will vote yes. I think it's an appropriate use of the land. And um, especially because there are no objections from neighbors, I will vote yes on this Joe? Uh, motion. I uh, vote to uh, rec recommend yes. It's a very good use and it'll be a beautiful site there. And the chair votes yes. Referring back to our uh, Marine Commercial District evaluation, many of the public comments at that time were that there is no longer a need for industrial zoning in the city of Lewis uh, since the dairy has departed with its purchase by the other dairy 
Um, I think this is an excellent change. I, I certainly applaud them moving to residential and you'll hear more about my applause when we go on to the specific zoning changes. But I think this is a good use and will be an, a, a well-deserved addition to the city for which there is demand in that location for residential property. So it's unanimous. Now we'll move on to C4, presentation, discussion, and possible recommendation to Mayor City Council regarding CZ-1-21, lands of 660 Pilot Town Road for a change of zone from one industrial zone to R2 low density residential for Sussex County tax map 335-4.14-110.00 and 111.00 portions thereof. Is there further discussion on this now zoning change? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Nancy makes a motion to approve the zoning change, I take it. You're muted. I'll, I'll second. And Joe second. Yes, I we, we read your mind, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you've discussion? already listed the full description of the property, so I assume I don't need to restate that. No. Any further discussion? So the motion is for R2, correct? Yes. Hmm. Industrial to R2. All right. Our council has advised us we need to um, vote again by individual. So I'll start with the sponsor of the motion, Nancy. Let me just say that you can say for the reason stated in the previous decision, yeah. I vote yes. Okay, uh, I, I uh, vote vote yes for the reason stated earlier, and I think R two specifically is the uh, is the uh, appropriate uh, zoning. Joe, for the reasons previously stated, I'm voting in favor. Yes for the new zoning. Bob, I vote in favor for the new zoning previously stated. Sumner? Uh, for the reasons mentioned uh, so far and, and the reasons I tried to give in the last motion, I, I, I think it's uh, uh, appropriate for this property to be part two. Melanie? I concur with the rationales expressed and vote in favor. Okay. I'll vote in favor for the reasons previously stated. You've now gone Darth Vader on us. I don't know what happened, <laughs> but. And the chair Sorry. associates himself with the gentlewoman from Second Street with her comments and the others. Uh, I think this is uh, the, the appropriate residential density. And as Sumner said, I think this is a vast improvement uh, going forward. So it is again a unanimous vote. Any other discussion on these issues? If not, I'm gonna move to item C5, which I ask to be added to the agenda for our edification and future consideration as we're looking at requests like we did the burden subdivision. As you know, we made recommendations with some waivers to Marin City Council, some questions arose, um, and I wanted to go over those just not to debate or to reconsider what we sent to Marin City Council, but to understand their questions. So as we see these issues come up again, we'll be better prepared to answer them. And I wanted, I wanted to impose on Council Person Osler, who I understand raised a very good question about the future use of these properties that I don't think we really fully considered. And I think it's just something that I'd like her to raise with us. We can discuss it if you want, but I really just wanted to raise the issue for something that we should consider going forward as we, as we find ourselves evaluating such proposals. You remember your brilliant uh, question? Nope, sure about don't. I, th I think I think it had I think it had to do with what happened. It, it was this what happens with the houses that, uh, as we as we've discussed, we we we've all heard um, what the the Mr. Bird, the current owner, wants to do. But what if in the future the houses are not uh, part of a family compound but become, for example, uh, Airbnbs, and that had to do with parking and a bunch of other issues. Is that is that what you wanted me to bring yes. up? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that was my issue. insightful uh, question. Yes, I think it was. And I don't think it was something that we really gave full weight to um, given the legacy of issues that surrounded this. Um, there were some, there is still an open question on the parking and the, in, the impact on the swale and other things, uh, both in terms of whether the street 
um, narrowing that we recommended is appropriate, how that's going to impact on the parking and on the water. Uh, are there other issues to know that I'm missing? No, um, not that I can think of. The, the council did make a recommendation regarding um, the streetlights and the sidewalks. They agreed with our- They uh, did, they agreed with the commission. Yes. But that also comes back to the point that, that Councilperson Osler made. We've waived something that applies in perpetuity essentially, although not exactly, but things could change dramatically if the family ownership is altered and things are different. But um, so I believe they've gone to Sussex County um, Conservation District. They've, they've got some other, Charlie's got some things to do to come back to Marin City Council with some assessment of the impact of the narrower street parking on the swale or on the grass uh, for their consideration at their next meeting. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So we should follow that just to give us some guidance going forward should we find ourselves faced with another major subdivision with these kinds of waiver requests. Um, let's go on to the reports. Drew, just quickly. Sorry, Sumner. So building on uh, Councilperson Osler's comments, I think in the back of my mind, well, I won't, I'll say it's actually in the front of my mind now, this question of Airbnb, um, you know, this may not be the time. It rarely is the time whenever it is that I come up with something to say, but I hope that at some time we will address what seems to me to be a growing number of houses that are converting to what I'll call businesses as rentals. We've always had a history of rentals, but it just seems like there's more and more of them. And it, ta it, it changes the nature of the way the neighborhoods work. It changes the nature of things like parking. And I, I just hope there's a way that we can discuss it in a way that we aren't surprised by what we get down the line. Well, may I make a suggestion since you were so um, <laughs> volunteering with your thoughts? Um, seriously, it, it's not heavy lifting. Why don't you talk to both Glenn and Janelle about your concern on rentals and see if there is a way that subject can come up in our consideration of other issues or separately if the case may be and we can discuss it. I mean, let's find out what our options are, what applicability um, either the regulations or code have before us, and then let's see whether we want to raise that issue as a recommendation to Marin City Council in one fashion or another. I think it's worth discussing. I don't know the outcome, and I don't expect to debate it tonight, but let's see realistically how we could address that if we choose to. Well, I think you can just pipe a lot of support for that from residents of the historic district who don't like what Airbnb is doing to small streets with limited parking. I think you'll find support for controlling yeah, I, it. I think Kay just, um, just basically raised the point that I wanted to raise, which is, um, this, is a, this is a challenge for the whole community. And so if the Planning Commission does want to take this on, um, you know, we need to hear from, from everyone who has uh, an opinion about it. I agree with that. And well, City Hall should be able to give you uh, an idea of how many Airbnb uh, license, well, how many rental licenses, but how many are Airbnb. I think the City Hall might be able to give you an, a number. So yeah. if I can answer, I actually did some training yesterday on this very subject about how um, short-term rentals are impacting uh, neighborhoods. So, and unfortunately there is no easy fix. Um, from what we've, I've been hearing and looking into, but I think it's just something we, we do have in the back of our heads. Um, you know, we keep uh, trying to figure out the best information possible, um, how to address that, because we want to make sure that, you know, while we have a lot of second homes here, a lot of rentals, short-term rentals, we want to maintain that, you know, those, those home ownership as well. So, you know, already in the back of our heads kind of thinking about this and, and, and kind of trying to get ideas on how to, how to best address the situation. Well, we'll look for you. I think it would be useful. Solution. Nancy, sorry. I, I think it would be useful, um, whether it's Janelle or someone else on the commission to pull together some of the data and information on this. Um, 
so that we really have a sense of the, the scope of the issues. Certainly agree. We, you know, it's better to deal with facts than hypothesis. Although one issue that I hear continually from citizens is the unlicensed, unauthorized rentals that are increasing in number. That may not be full seasonal rentals, meaning week by week or for a full season, but maybe occasional rentals um, that are causing problems of all the magnitude we've been discussing, parking and partying and other out of control uh, activities that really infringe on the sanctity of the neighborhood. So I think it is, we can get some data on what's officially registered and, and what we can find, um, but I think it's, it is a worthwhile consideration. And to Councilperson Osler's comment I just started to say before, we try every opportunity we can to have public input, public hearing, public messaging. This would be no exception because it is a sensitive issue on both sides. Um, and we would reach out to H Park uh, and others to make sure that they've offered their thoughts as well uh, on, on the future of these things because they have some say, at least on the historic district and the use of the property. So um, Sumner, thank you for raising it. Um, uh, it's always timely to raise issues. There's never an out of season issue, period. All right. Okay, let's go to subcommittees. Annexation zones re re subcommittee. So um, I'd hope to refresh my memory on the meeting that we had, what was it, two weeks ago now? Uh, we had a really nice meeting going, a great discussion um, on, that started with uh, Melanie uh, giving us a lesson on traditional neighborhood design and it got us into a really good discussion about issues of streetscape and some of the things that she was getting at earlier uh, when we were talking about Lewis Waterfront Preserve, but uh, we were just getting going on a really great conversation. And then I guess uh, another Zoom user got in there and cut us off and we didn't really get to finish. Uh, I look forward to carrying on what was a really nice discussion. Sorry about that, Sumner. <laughs> I, I, I am such Zoom user. <laughs> Oh, well, apologies accepted. Uh, you know, I, I, as uh, uh, Nancy said, I, I mean, you know, I think we've learned some things about how we define open space. We've learned some things about how we use open space and how we arrange open space. And I, I think also, given the conversations that that we had the other day, there's there's an interest in in seeing how we design how we imagine the streets working vis-a-vis -vis the houses and so on. It gets to the, some of the things that, that Melanie brought up earlier about where the cars are and where the sidewalks and trees are and all that. Don't know where it's going, but looking forward to it. Well, and I, I wanna just say, uh, Melanie's raised these issues a couple of times on a couple of the applications that have been before us. I think this is really the area where we can maybe get some benefit from her insights and her history in this regard and come up with some creative or innovative ideas that we can apply going forward. So Melanie, I encourage you to, to dive into this and to come up with some ideas and um, even bring them to the full commission if, if necessary, because I think they deserve airing and I think they're important for the future. Um, and, so I, and, uh, I wanna just reiterate, I encourage you to do so. I um, guess I would also say that I think I expect that in the course of the conversations that we've had so far, as well as what is in front of us, that we may have some, some items that we would suggest for major subdivisions in general, but that's just my feeling. I don't know how the others feel. I see a nod over there and, yep, yeah. all right. Well, and, and we're gonna address that in the not too distant future as well. All right, floodplain. Muted. You're muted again. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Melody. Yeah. Oh. Bob, can you read lips? Is that it? <laughs> You're still mute. There you go. All right. So uh, we have received comments from the Corps of Engineers. Um, they see, appear to be fairly minor. We have a meeting, a subcommittee meeting next week uh, when we'll discuss them, hopefully resolve the issues and um, 
uh, get a response back to the core. Great. Thank you. I'll skip sea level rise since Mr. Panetta is not with us. Wetlands buffer. Okay, anything to update for you? Leave us. That's good. At, at this point now, it's John. And I actually have something from John. Okay. Um, so uh, I was talking to him earlier uh, last week and um, or late last week. And as part of uh, the wetlands buffer ordinance, the adoption by mayor and council, they sent it back to the commission, which then went back to the subcommittee for further look through. And the subcommittee did actually look at this and, and discussed it. Um, and they believed that based on the experts at the water workshop, that they had reached out to the subject matter experts and had gotten their Im impact and would actually like to see it, the ordinance, um, go into effect and see how it, how it, it's used before they recommend any changes to the ordinance. Um, because since it's just been adopted and nobody's taken advantage of it, they'd rather see um, a, a practical um, application of the ordinance before recommending any uh, changes to it. So that is the recommendation from the subcommittee. And then that is something that the commission then can make some type of recommendation to, back to council so we can close this loop um, with it being referred back to the count, to the commission. So the commission agenda for May should include the referral back from the subcommittee. I'm guessing, Glenn, could they potentially do that tonight as the report out of the subcommittee? You're muted. Sorry, you know, I, I was I was looking at something I want to discuss in, in a moment on my my report. What was what was the question reporting back to? Do we need to, as an item coming out of a subcommittee report, does it need, do we need a specific item on the agenda? I'm just asking for my knowledge um, to have it on an agenda for the commission to make a recommendation based on a subcommittee recommendation. I really think you do. I, okay. It's not noticed on the agenda to, to take any action on it. Thanks. Yeah. It, just a question about everything Janelle said. It, in that discussion in the wetlands, committee was there any discussion about how you would evaluate the success you know criteria whatever was there any discussion about that so the the questions that were posed back to from council were um the c level uh the subject matter experts um which uh the subcommittee had you know they had uh, as part of the multiple water workshops um, gotten that expertise back from them. And then, you know, there was questions about if it needed to be expanded to 100 feet. And I think the subcommittee just wanted to see, you know, at the 50 feet, is it going to do what it, it's supposed to? So that was, you know, like before, it, they, I think they wanted to like see what, how the ordinance works before changing an ordinance that just got adopted. So, so that's that's the nature of my question is how will we know if it's doing what we want it to do? And I think you'll see it you'll get an idea when an application comes through or two applications come through that would have wetlands and is it is it meeting what your expectations were, you know, for compliance with with the code? Well, I think it's an issue that Sumner's raising that certainly we'll expect the subcommittee to address because I'm not sure that just on an application, we'll know the answer. Um, if we're looking at testing it over time to see if it applicability is sufficient, um, I think we need to have some other demonstration or measurement of its effectiveness or not. So as you work, Janelle, with the subcommittee, report back to us, I think it's important to uh, at least attempt to address the issue of evaluating its effectiveness or utility um, in terms of whether or not it's working and whether or not changes need to be made. Right, and at that, and right now the recommendation is don't make any changes. Well, I got that. Um, so yeah, um, but I think as, as applications come through, I think, you know, uh, the commission can always go, hey, or the subcommittee can go, hey, we wanna get back together and take a look and, and look at, at things as applications come through. Well, and I think that's the what their intent was. Let's put it on the May agenda and note that that'll be a question that will 
we'll try and discuss. All right, let's move on to reports. Um, to our short time uh, city council liaison. Nothing to report. Goodbye. <laughs> when you were, you had some comments. The only thing I wanted to mention, Mr. Chair, is that um, Monday night city council will be meeting. And one thing of maybe of some planning interest is there's a an agreement for the placement of the swing bridge, which is supposed to be moved by Delgat um, this this July. So of some interest, the, the current proposal and the direction that everybody's been moving toward is placing the swing bridge at the end of American Legion Road between the trail and, and Freeman Highway. And that's all I had, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just, just one clarification on that. I think we, I think Glenn, we already approved that placement. You did, I that's believe, correct. I believe what we're now looking at is uh, the maintenance agreements um, and, you know, where will it be? How will it be situated? Who has to take care of it? Uh, what will the fence look like? That the, the more of the details of the placement. That's right. That's yeah. Right. All right, Janelle, do you have anything else you would like to share with us? I do not. Anne Marie, as city manager. I just want to remind people about the election on May 8th, and I apologize for the dishes in the background. My husband's washing the dishes and it's really loud. Well, congratulations on having a professional dishwasher. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there are elections, as we know, for city council and board of public works. Commissioners, any other comments or insights? Bob? We did have a sea level rise committee meeting um, with starting to look at uh, major developments and get ourselves organized with that, with the um, uh, experts that Anne Marie sort of put us in touch with from DENREC and, and the state. Um, and the big event for us really is the public hearing uh, that the city council is holding on May 3rd about the, pro the proposed uh, proposal that we passed up to them about um, minor development and redevelopment. That does, uh, should be an interesting meeting with a lot of um, active comment. I think that's a great understatement. <laughs> um, Bonnie's going out with a lot of uh, interesting issues on the table. I, I think uh, whoever takes my seat is, is going to be very busy very quickly. Yes, it will stay warm. I, All right, I, I wish move on to the minutes. That. Um, as I alluded to at the beginning, I think Jackie was trying to trick us up, um, or me, frankly, on the minutes of the regular meeting on item uh, under B, unfinished business item five, um, there was a vote of seven to two in favor of the Panetta motion, uh, but she did not record my vote individually. I think she was just making sure I read the minutes to see if that was correct. So. I would move to a minute, amend the minutes of March 17th to record my positive vote in favor of item B5 on the Panetta motion. Unless there's an objection, I'm gonna assume that that amendment to the minutes is accepted. Is there a motion to approve the minutes as amended? Melanie, Sumner seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 Now the enormously long public hearing minutes that probably took us all 30 seconds to read. Are there any changes or additions we wish to that? No. If not, do I have a motion to approve? It's moved. Okay, same two, Melanie and Sumner. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, um, I think we're up to an adjournment and I would like to suggest that our departing vice chair make the motion to adjourn <laughs> the last meeting. After 20 years, I will say uh, I make a motion that we adjourn. And thank you very much, my friends. It's been a great 20 years. Thank you, Kay. Melanie seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 We are aye. adjourned at 813. Thank you all very much for your contributions. I appreciate all your help. Glenn and Janelle, thank you. Bonnie, best wishes. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.